And though you are turning to Luke right now, by the end this morning, we will be in John 21 and begin our study of the final chapter of the Gospel of John. So this is the first of, this is part one of this sermon titled, A Higher Calling. Jesus calls each of us to give our lives to Him, to submit to His higher calling for us. The outline that's in your handout works a little bit differently this morning. You see there are four major themes there, the recipients of the call, the nature of the call, the higher purpose of the call, and then the character of the one who calls. Uh, That's not, those aren't the four parts of the message this morning, but four themes that you want to look for as we work through these different passages today. So we're going to begin by going back to the early days of the earthly ministry of Jesus when he began calling his disciples to follow him. Before we do that, let's pray one more time. Father, we have spoken to you this morning about our commitment to stand on what you've said in your word, that we need not fear the future days you have. If you did not spare your own son for us, surely then you will not also with him freely give us all things. And so we are confident of our standing in Christ, confident that we stand in grace, confident that if we were to go somewhere to find hope and strength and refreshment, there would be no better place to go than your living word. And so we come this morning I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke 5 tells the story of the call of Levi. You more commonly know Levi as Matthew. Luke 5 verse 27 After that, Jesus went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. So one of our themes this morning is the recipients of the call. What kind of people did Jesus call? Well, what kind of man is Levi? A tax collector, sometimes called a publican. He's a Jew who's working for the Romans, collecting some type of taxes. So he would have been viewed as a compromiser, a collaborator with the Romans. He turned his back on his own people to make money. Tax collectors were also known for taking advantage of their own people through dishonesty and extortion. Tax collectors were kind of like the rich guy who sits in the corner and he kind of knows everybody hates him, but he doesn't care because he's rich. That was who these men were. And surely God would never have anything to do with those guys until Jesus calls a tax collector to come follow him. If Levi can come, anybody can come. And what is the nature of the call? Follow me. Choose a new direction. You've been following greed. You've been chasing money. You've been living for self. Now, come follow me. Verse 28 And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. The nature of the call involves a new direction. He left everything behind to come follow Jesus, and it involved submission. He obeyed the call. He obeyed Jesus. He submitted his life to Jesus. Verse 29, And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. So this tax collector had a big change of heart. Greed was replaced by generosity as he hosted at his own expense a big party to introduce his friends to Jesus. He now had a higher calling. You see, one day, Levi's purpose was to get rich at any cost. That was his calling. The next day, Levi was blessing people and introducing them to Jesus. Verse 30, the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see, to share a meal with someone is to welcome them. It is to indicate that you accept them. You desire to build some type of relationship with them. So it was very troubling for the Pharisees that Jesus would share a meal with people like tax collectors. And this principle about eating together, it's why we set aside a little portion of our church budget so that our pastors can 
eat with people. It's one of the reasons why at the grace group, small group level, we often eat together, and why we have church-wide times when we eat together, and why next Sunday on care night, we encourage you to share lunch or dinner with somebody else in our church family. And it's why if you want to, to see building or deepening or healing in your relationship with someone else, eat with them. Because that says, I welcome you. I want to know you better. I would enjoy being with you. And so, in defiance of the Pharisees, Jesus ate with this crowd of Levi's friends. I was at a church once that encouraged us to have Matthew dinners, invite unsaved people over for dinner. Jesus also spoke to the Pharisees, verses 31 and 32, and Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So who are the recipients? That's one of our themes. Who are the recipients of the call of Jesus? Sinners. Now that means everybody because everybody is a sinner. But what Jesus obviously means here is the people who know they are sinners, the people who humbly admit that they're sick, people like Levi. All right, now go with me to John chapter 1. We're actually going to come back to Luke 5, but for now go to John 1. This is another story early in Jesus' ministry, another call. And we're not going to look at this passage in very much detail, but we're going to see here this idea of a higher calling, a new direction, something more to live for. John 1, 35. Again, the next day, John, and that's not John, the writer of the gospel and the apostle, that's John the Baptist, we call him. And the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. So his two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, it's translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. What's the first thing he did? He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, Simon, and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, rock, stone. The next day, Jesus purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to Philip, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. All right, let's pause there. So we've, we've seen there, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathanael. Now we're going to get a more specific call to Peter uh, back in Luke 5, um, and we'll also add James and John. But you see, what happens here is, first of all, they start going to get other people to tell them about Jesus, right? Come and see. That's a great little line. And anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, come see. And with Peter, Jesus says, you're Simon. Mm, we're going to call you Peter, Cephas, the rock. Well, what does that mean? He didn't tell him but doesn't it indicate there's something higher for him? And Nathaniel, Nathaniel says, I can't believe this. I can't believe what you know. You've, you're acting like king of Israel. You're acting like a son of God to know those things. And Jesus says, really? You're going to see bigger stuff than this. You see, 
He's coming to these men and he's saying, come, follow me. And he's saying to these men, there's something greater for you. There are bigger things ahead for you, right? All right, so we've got Levi, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel. Now go to, back to Luke 5. Now here we get the more specific call for Peter and at the same time, James and John. Luke 5, 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God. Okay, pause right there. This is very early in Jesus' ministry. He is a new teacher who has just shown up in Galilee and people are coming to say, hey, we want to hear this guy. So the crowds are pressing around him and he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the same thing as the Sea of Tiberias and the same thing as the Sea of Galilee. Three different names. They lived in a world of different languages. That's part of why we have Levi and Matthew and Gennesaret and Tiberias and Galilee and that kind of thing. So this is the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is there. The crowds are pressing around him. Verse 2, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. So it's morning time, right? When the fishermen return from their night of fishing, they're cleaning and rinsing their nets before they go to bed. Verse 3, and he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. What a coincidence. Simon is that guy that he'd met before and changed, given him a nickname. And now he just happens to get in Simon's boat. Do you think there were any other boats around there? Just happens to get in Simon's boat. Joy for Simon. He's been working all night long, trying to get his nets rinsed out and ready to go home to bed. And now this new teacher climbs in his boat and says to him, put out a little way from the land. And Jesus sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Apparently, sitting down was a normal, a normal way for teaching. And I thought, hey, that's a great idea. I could sit down while I teach. And then I thought, wait a second, I can't sit down. I move way too much. Well, that is not going to work. Remember that the nature of the call involves submitting your life to Jesus. Is Peter submitting in verse 3? He must be already. Jesus says, put your boat out into the water, and he does it. And look at it continue in verses 4 and 5. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I'll do as you say and let down the nets. There it is again, submission. Submission to what Jesus says. This is a carpenter telling some fishermen how to fish. It's daytime. You don't take a big net, drag it through the water in the middle of the daytime and say, hey, school of fishy fishies, come swim into my net. This isn't going to work. But what does Peter do? He submits. You can't come follow Jesus if you won't submit to him. Jesus is not looking for people to tell him what to do. He's looking for people whom he can tell what to do because he's the master. Verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter had some serious spiritual sensitivity. He realizes that only somebody sent by God could do what Jesus just did. But Peter also has guilt. He feels fearful, and he feels unworthy to be around this Jesus. Remember how the Pharisees didn't think that Jesus should be around the tax collectors? Peter didn't think that Jesus should be around him. Jesus, what are you doing hanging around with people like me? And Peter's going to soon learn that such humility is actually the first step to being close to Jesus. Many years later, he wrote, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Those who receive the call of Jesus are those who have a humble heart, those who know they are sick and need a physician. Peter said, go away from me, Lord. But actually, Peter was just the kind of needy person to whom Jesus draws near. Now, Peter was not alone here, for his business partners, James and John, were with him. Verse 10 says, look at verse 9, for amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. There's the higher calling, plain as day, right? You've been catching fish. You know, as many as seven of the 12 disciples might have been fishermen, but Jesus had a higher purpose. From now on, it says in verse 10, from now on, this was the turning point. This was when life took a new direction. When you submit your life to Jesus, he leads you in the direction of a higher calling. It doesn't mean everybody should leave their jobs because that's not really the essence of the higher calling. It's not about whether you catch fish or put together pieces of wood or sell insurance. It's about what direction your life is headed. And really, we ought to just ask all of us this morning, did you, have you had one of those from now on moments when your life headed in a different direction? And yeah, you still might be selling insurance like you were before or putting together boards like you were before, but your life is not going the same direction anymore. You're actually living for something more. You've got a higher calling. They would now fish for men. You fish for fish so that you can kill them and sell them. You fish for men so that you can save them and serve them. It was a much higher calling. Verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. As Daryl Bach said, Peter's CPA probably wasn't very happy, but they had a higher calling than catching fish to earn money. Their lives would now have a new focus, greater purposes. The call is to give our lives to him and live our lives for him. All right, so whose call have we seen? Levi, Nathaniel, Andrew, Peter, Philip, James, John. Now go to John 21, the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, after the resurrection. The text here is going to tell us that this is the third major appearance of Jesus to a group of his disciples. So there was the first resurrection Sunday evening, There was eight days later, probably the next Sunday, and then this. Don't know when, sometime between eight and 40 days after his resurrection. John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples. Where? Same place we've just been, at the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. So this gets our attention right away. You know, Jesus had told the women, tell his disciples, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Why take him back to Galilee? That's where it all started. Galilee is where they had the from now on moment. Galilee is where Jesus called them to come follow him. So Jesus takes them back to the place where it all began. Sometimes we need Jesus to do that with us. You need to go back to your first love. You need to go back to what it was like when you and your heart said, I'm going to come follow Jesus. Because you, 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 you go, you start to live for his higher calling, but man, fish can make a lot of money and they take a lot of work and effort and attention. And if you put more time and more focus and more attention, you could be the best fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. And pretty soon, oh yeah, where's Jesus? And that can happen to all of us. And so Jesus says, let's go back to where we were at the beginning. Let's go back to where this all started. Verse 2, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Canaan and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Not a surprise, they're together. They've been together a lot. Jesus sent them back up there to, to wait for him. So these seven guys are together. And who are they? Well, Simon Peter, we just saw his call. Thomas, we don't know about his call, but we talked about him last week, right? We know about Thomas, and then we have Nathaniel. We just saw his call. 
Nathaniel, you think you've seen big things? Just wait, you're going to see greater things. And then we have the sons of Zebedee, James and John. We just saw their call, and then two other disciples who are not named. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, the other six guys, I'm going fishing. All right, he's going fishing, good or bad. Good idea, bad idea. What do you think? This is how commentators make their money. No. We're not told why they went fishing. And I think there's a sense in which sometimes it seems like what the Bible does is it just leaves you to consider the possibilities. You don't actually need to know why they did. You just need to think through why you might have and whether that would have been good or not good. You know? So let's just think that through. Let's just say up front, we don't know. We don't know why they went fishing. But first of all, they might have been fishing just to pass the time while they waited for Jesus. If you have the patience to bear with fishing, it's a great way to pass lots of time. <laughs> I'll be honest that I don't understand, but many people do, and that's, that's cool. Though we'll learn that they fished all night, which, now again, I, fishermen, I don't really understand, but it still seems to me that even most fishermen don't pleasure fish all night long, but maybe some do. But it seems more likely that if they fished all night long, that this was a serious trip to make money. This is a commercial trip, fishing trip. And so it's not hard to see why they could have needed money. Remember, these guys all left their jobs to follow Jesus. And now, and and when they were when they were with Jesus, there were various ways in which they were provided for. Sometimes a miraculous, often very common through the gifts of people. But now Jesus is gone. Guess what? Where's the money going to come from? Where's the food going to come from? You can see how it's possible that these guys might have said, listen, we're not going to have food today if we don't go work. And so what do they know how to do? They know how to fish. They're already up in Galilee, so let's let's go to work. It's also possible, though, that they were going back to fishing because they were thinking about giving up on following Jesus. Now, again, I'm not going to say that's what they were doing. I don't know, but I could see myself doing that. And it's happened to a lot of followers of Jesus where they felt like, you know what? This following Jesus thing just isn't working out for me. As a matter of fact, it seems like everything just keeps going wrong. And it just makes me feel like quitting. You've probably heard people say that. We've probably felt like that sometimes. This is too hard. I quit. (laughs) I just want to quit. And, you know, there had been all that resurrection excitement, but then no Jesus. Where is he? What is going on? He sent us up here to wait for him. When's he going to come? Maybe, maybe our higher calling wasn't really anything higher at all. Maybe we should just go back to fishing. So was this a harmless fishing trip or was it a problem? The Bible just invites us to consider both possibilities. But the end of verse 3 says, They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And by the way, you can fit seven men in one of those boats easily. If you go online and you search for a Galilee boat, uh, there's a, in 1985-86, there was a, the the water levels in the Sea of Galilee were really low, so low that they uncovered a fishing boat from around the time of Jesus in fairly intact. Um, So you can actually see the size these are, these are big 20 to 30 foot fishing boats. So these seven guys get in the boat and that night they caught nothing. Now, does that sound a little bit like you, like the first, first verse from our summer memory challenge? You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. They fished all night and caught nothing. Was that just a coincidence or was that a work of God? Is God the kind of God who would use his sovereign power to allow you to fish all night but prevent you from catching anything? If we started to drift away from our real purposes as his followers 
Is that the kind of thing God might do to draw us back to our higher calling? Would it be merciful and gracious if he did that? And we don't have to wonder for very long if if God was in on this. (laughs) Because verse 4 But when the day was now breaking and they get to the end of their night catching nothing, guess who stood on the beach? Jesus. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Verse 5, so Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. All right, the word children's not an insult. It, It probably means something like our English word guys. So Jesus is just speaking to them like a friendly stranger would speak to people fishing. Hey, guys, not catching anything out there tonight? That's what he says. Which is, you know, friendly. It's just if when, when things are going wrong and it's frustrating, it's even more frustrating when somebody shows up and makes you talk about it. You know, you're trying to change the brakes in your car and four hours later, your wife comes out and cheery. Hey, how's it going, honey? Hey, guys, you haven't caught anything tonight, have you? Now, in the early morning light to them, the stranger's just a, a hazy form more than 100 yards away on the shore line. But if they had recognized Jesus, they might have remembered John 15, 5, apart from me, you can't do anything. Verse 6, and he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. Okay, that's weird. It's one thing for a stranger to ask if you've caught anything. It's another thing for them to give you fishing advice. But for whatever reason, these guys decided it was worth one last try. So they did what the stranger said. They moved the nets back to the right side of the boat. And the end of verse 6 says they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, a big haul of fish isn't a big, I mean, isn't a big shock because that's the way that kind of fishing works. When the school swims into your net, you catch a lot at once. But this clearly was about more than just a lucky placement of the net. This was about the presence and power of Jesus. All night long, without the presence and power of Jesus, they caught nothing. But in just a few moments of his presence and power, a great haul of fish. This is the character of the one who calls us, and submitting to his call is a joy when we know his character. When God is present and his power is at work, everything changes. Human effort without God will get nowhere all night long. Human effort with God can be powerful in just a few brief moments. From my perspective as a pastor, it means that a a whole month of pastoral effort without God can accomplish nothing, while just a few minutes of pastoral effort with God can change a person's life. The same is true for you. Parents, do you hear this? parent, do I hear this? The presence and power of Jesus. The point wasn't the right side of the boat, for they had tried that all night long. You know, it wasn't like they'd just been out of God's will all night long because they'd been on the left side of the boat. And if they just would have gotten in God's will on the right side of the boat, they would have caught fish. No, 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 no. The point was Jesus showed up. The presence and power of Jesus. So here's what I did as I worked on this sermon. When I got to this point in my study, I started making out a long list of you guys and the things in your life that are like fishing all night long and not catching anything. The heartaches and the long-term prayer requests and the struggles and the temptations. And there are many things I don't know about, but there are many things I do know about. And I wrote it, actually wrote it out in my notes, a long list of people in our church family and the things that they're, they desperately need to see happen and they're praying for and seems like it's not happening. And I wrote that list out to remind me that what is needed in every one of those situations is the presence and power of Jesus. And I know that doesn't solve all the challenges and you might say, well, that's what I've been seeking all along. Good, keep seeking. But we also need to ask about those times when we actually stop seeking the presence and power of Jesus and we decide we're going to pull it off ourselves. We're going to pull off the Abraham and Hagar and force it by the effort of the flesh. It's not going to work. We've got to keep looking to Jesus and fixing our hope on him. 
So after a long night of frustrated fishing, suddenly there's a major breakthrough. Suddenly the nets were full. Verse 7, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, probably John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. That's a bad place to land because it stopped because it sounds like he drowned himself or something. <laughs> Probably they were all ready to shallow water because verse 8 refers to the little boat that they used. So maybe he was swimming some. He may have even just been wading in uh, the rest of that 100 yards to Jesus. So he did not throw himself into the sea to drown himself. So here you have two different disciples displaying their positive qualities. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. He had the insight to quickly recognize Jesus. He didn't recognize the sight of Jesus. He recognized a gracious, powerful work of Jesus. And he said, that can only come from Jesus. Who else could do something like this And who else would know we were out here fishing empty all night? And who else would care for us like this? The power, the knowledge, the care, it's got to be Jesus. And we need that same ability to quickly recognize every good and perfect gift that comes down from our loving Father. What I try to do, I'm not good at this, but what I try to do to keep a record of these things is I've got a huge section from the last oh, almost four years now, in my prayer journal, where I write down the... I I try to start my prayer time each day by noting the sweet providences of God, those kind gifts that He's sent my direction. And I I have to do that because I'm not very good at it. (laughs) But I want to learn and say more quickly and more often, it's the Lord. Did you see that? So that's what John does. But then Peter's got his own commendable quality, for when John recognized Jesus, Peter grabs his outer garment and jumps out of the boat. Why? To get to Jesus as quickly as possible. He just is eager to get to Jesus. Forget the other guys. They can deal with the fish. I'm going to Jesus. Again, the Bible invites you to consider what happened when Peter got to shore. He doesn't tell you what did happen. Here he comes up out of the Sea of Galilee after having worked all night long, and now he's been in the water, and he comes up to Jesus. What did he do? Did he give him a big wet hug? Did he fall down and grab his feet like the women did after the resurrection and worship? I don't know. I don't know what he did, but there must have been a few precious minutes there when it was just Jesus and Peter on the shore the other guys out there wrestling in the boat and the net full of fish. Now, this miraculous catch of fish and Peter jumping out of the boat might bring to your mind a couple of other stories. First of all, it's not the first time Peter jumped out of a boat, right? To go to Jesus. This, <laughs> he, he had practice, yeah. There was that night when the disciples' boat was being battered by the storm. It was another night of frustration, The way it's described, it wasn't just that it was a storm, it was that the wind was contrary to them. They're trying to get across the Sea of Galilee, and it's not working. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but don't have enough. You earn wages, but put them in a purse with holes in it. You row all night, and you're still only halfway across the lake. It was one of those nights. And then Jesus came to them across the water. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, and by a miracle of Jesus, he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. So that's an interesting connection, but there's a better connection. It's the story we've already seen. When Jesus taught from Peter's boat, and he told Peter to put down the nets, and there was another miraculous catch of fish. That was when Peter came to follow Jesus. And the most important connection How did Peter respond to Jesus that first time? The first time he said, get away from me, Jesus. And the second time he said, it's the Lord, I'm I'm going to him. Isn't that beautiful? Peter had learned. Three years later, Peter has learned. Well, do you think Peter still knows he's a sinful man three years later? 
You know what we're going to read in just a minute? We're going to read about the charcoal fire on which Jesus cooked breakfast. You know how many charcoal fires there are in the New Testament? Two. One in the courtyard when Peter denied Jesus, and one on this beach. You think Peter still knew he was a sinner? He's got a fresh reminder of it right there, of his denial, of his failure. So does Peter jump out of the boat and come to Jesus because Peter has decided that now he's worthy of Jesus? No, Peter has decided that now Jesus is different from who Peter thought he was. He's just as great as Peter thought he was, but Jesus is the kind of person who welcomes sinners. And so this is a shift that we all need. See, at first, Jesus the King is a threat. He's a threat to our own way. He's a threat to our sin. He's a threat to our freedom. And then Jesus the Judge is a threat to us, condemning us for our sin. But then as we come to understand the cross, we see that Jesus died for sinners like us, that he draws near to the humble and the brokenhearted. He came not for people who think they are righteous, but for people who know they are sinners. Someone said, the church is the only institution on earth where the only qualification is your unworthiness. And so Peter learned that. He learned that Jesus is just the kind of king and savior and God to whom you run to when you're a mess. And so when we begin to understand the character of the one who calls us, that Jesus loves and saves unworthy people like us, then we don't say, go away from me, Jesus. We jump out of the boat to come to him. I want to read you a testimony this morning. There's a little portion of this that's used in the Restore study. This is from a book about abuse by Justin and Lindsay Holcomb. It's a wonderful book called Rid of, Rid of My Disgrace. And that book incorporates several different testimonies in it. And here's a portion of one of them. Here's what this lady says about how she came to give her life to Jesus. A girlfriend kept inviting me to church, and I decided I'd finally go just once so she'd leave me alone. I always assumed that Christianity was about following a list of do's and don'ts. I thought, especially because I felt so dirty and damaged, that if I wanted to participate in church, I'd have to fix myself up first. See, there's the go away from me Jesus idea. But when she went to church, the message I heard that morning was the exact opposite. I heard that if I have faith in Jesus, God knows me, loves me, forgives me, vindicates my suffering, and calls me his own. It is all about Jesus and not what I have done, will do, need to do, or even what has been done to me. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, God does not see me as defiled, damaged, dirty, or unworthy. Never in all my life had I heard such good news before. It took a while for me to trust in Jesus, but God was gentle and patient with me. However, I didn't feel secure in his love for me. I feared that once God realized how messed up I really was, he would eventually leave me. There it is again. Then the light dawned on me. God created me and knows me. He knows everything that happened to me, everything I've done, and all the dirtiness, filth, and shame I'd felt. His grace is bigger than my life, bigger than my pain, bigger than my sin. He came down from his throne, took on flesh, and willingly went to the cross for me. There is no greater love than this. And so, as people have lied, hurt, abused, mistreated, and abandoned me, I, too, had lied, hurt, abused, mistreated, and abandoned God, yet he still loves me. I am not damaged goods. I am his daughter, more precious than gold. When we begin to understand the character of the one who calls us, instead of saying, go away from me, Jesus, we begin to eagerly draw near to him. Really submitting to him, to his call, is a joy when you know the one who calls you. Verse 8, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus 
had prepared breakfast for them. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He could rebuke them for their sin and their doubt. He could call them all to bow and worship. His voice could roar like Niagara Falls. His words could slice like a sword. His gaze could burn like flaming torches. Instead, he's made a hot breakfast for some very tired fishermen. This is the character of the one who calls us. And he says to them, verse 12, Come and have breakfast. (laughs) You see the kind of things Jesus says after his resurrection to the women on the road? Hey, how are you this morning? Greetings. Peace to you. Guys, not caught anything out there tonight? Come and have breakfast. That's Jesus. That's who he is. Same Jesus as creator and king and judge says, come and have breakfast. And do you see the connection there to what we talked about earlier? Eating with somebody says, I welcome you. I accept you. I want to know you. And Jesus calls these men and says, hey, let's eat. That's a tender picture of his relationship with his followers, his love for them, his love for us, how he provides for us, how much he enjoys our presence, how much he welcomes us. And this is why heaven is sometimes described as one eternal feast together with God. When Jesus drank the wine at that Passover meal the night before he died, he said, I'm not going to drink this again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come into him and we'll dine with him and he with me. But Jesus wasn't just eating with them. He was serving them breakfast. And this, too, is a picture of what eternity will be like with Jesus. He pictured this in one of his parables, Luke 12, when he said, it says, blessed are those who's, blessed are those slaves who are ready and waiting when the master returns. I tell you, he himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they eat. That's how Jesus wanted you to think about what it will be like when he comes back. That kind of character is the person who calls you to submit your life to him. And by the way, until heaven, until that eternal feast, there is still a meal ready for you whenever you stay close to Jesus. He's got breakfast prepared for you every day. And when you're weary and when you're hungry, he's got it ready for you. And again, it connects to what we've been saying before that if we don't come to him because we're too busy, we're too distracted, we're too self-confident, I just can't, I don't need my Bible, I don't have time to read my Bible, you know what? We're the ones missing out. It's like saying, I don't know if there's breakfast in the kitchen, but I'm not going downstairs, I'm too tired. Well, you might be sorry some mornings for what you missed out on. And gratefully, he chases us sometimes too, right? He brings breakfast upstairs. He's got meals ready for you every day. Come to him. Come and have breakfast. All right, we're going to get that too. We'll continue these things next Sunday in part two, all right? But let me just try to summarize what we saw this morning. We have a higher calling. When Jesus calls us to come follow him, that doesn't mean he calls us to leave our jobs. It means that he, he turns the entire direction of our lives toward him and toward people. Now you're going to catch men. Now we submit to Jesus. We live for people. We have higher purposes. Now the problem is we're sinners who try to run away from Jesus. But he calls us instead to be like John and see his good hand in our lives And to be like Peter and jump out of the boat and get to him as fast as you can, even when you feel the weight of your guilt and your shame. And you might even be tempted along the way to give up, to decide it's just too hard to try to follow him and live for higher things, but Jesus will keep drawing you back. He might even frustrate some of our other pursuits, some of our other empty pursuits, so that we'll come back to what is really worth living for. And ultimately, the reason why we hear his call and continue to follow is because of the one who's calling us. We know what he's like. The one 
the one who steps in with gracious power after the long night of frustration for his disciples, the one who cooked and served breakfast to those tired men. We say, if that's what he's like, then when he calls me to submit my life to him, I'd be a fool to say no. There's no higher calling than his because there's no one better than him. He'll always be faithful. So don't go back to fishing. Fishing. 